job, little brother. High five. No. All right. Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Colton Ogburn, and these are all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, the final film of the DC Extended Universe. So we're going to dive into lots of fun stuff, like how this movie mirrored several Marvel films, the comics the story was adapted from, such as Aquaman, Dark Destiny, Deadly Dreams, and even a fun little tease for what's next for Jason Momoa in the DC Universe. So guys, look, I know I'm the weirdo who liked The Flash, and maybe Maybe I'm the weirdo here too, but I really enjoyed this movie, and while it's the final chapter of the DCEU, it really didn't feel that way. And speaking of saying goodbye to the DCEU, be sure to check out our collaboration of eulogies for the DCEU video, which is up on the channel now, featuring friends of the channel like The Real Rejects, Nando V Movies, Emergency Awesome, and more. We've also got an awesome Rest in Peace DCEU shirt up on our merch store now, featuring lots of fun DCEU inspired Easter eggs. Shopping our merch store is a great way to support the channel and everything we do here. Thank you so much. Anyway, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom felt very much like a traditional superhero movie sequel, and that was so refreshing to see. Nowadays, most superhero movie sequels require you to have seen the crossover movies that came in between the first movie and the sequel, and then the sequel and the the third film, it, it's it's easy to get lost if you're a casual moviegoer. But this movie, it was a genuine sequel that followed up on the consequences set up in the first film with Black Manta. So quick refresher, in the first Aquaman movie, we saw Arthur and his brother Orm go toe to toe for the throne, but that film's secondary villain was David Kane as Black Manta, a character who first debuted in Aquaman number 35 way back in 1967. In the opening scene of the first Aquaman film, we see Arthur fight pirates on a submarine. During this fight, Arthur faces off against David Kane and his father. David's father doesn't make it out alive, and from that moment on, David is committed to getting revenge on Aquaman. So this movie, just like in the first film, opens with Aquaman fighting pirates on a boat, paralleling the origins of Black Manta and foreshadowing the return of the villain in his upgrade to lead antagonist. In Arthur's narration at the start of the movie, we learn that like in the comics, he and Mira have gotten married and had a son, who they've named Arthur Jr., just like in the comics. In this narration sequence, showing Arthur living his split life between land and sea, we see him riding a motorcycle, which got me to thinking that this may have been a wink and a nod to what's next for Jason Momoa in James Gunn's new DC universe. Ryan, myself, and many others have been saying for a while now that he'd be great as the space biker and Superman villain, Lobo. Hey, no riders! So in this montage scene, we also see Arthur and his dad sharing Guinness beer, which is apparently Jason Momoa's favorite beer, according to my mom, and he even has his own line of Guinness beer. My mom's obsessed with Jason Momoa, so I have lots of fun Jason Momoa facts for you. Now, when we meet back up with Black Manta, we see facial scars from his big fight with Arthur in the last movie when he got his ass kicked by a cliff. Now, working for Black Manta is everyone's favorite character actor, Asian Jim, as well as the MCU's very own Jimmy Woo, Randall Park. James E. Woo. FBI. Randall Park is playing a character called Dr. Stephen Shin. In the comics, Dr. Shin was introduced in 2011's Aquaman Volume 7, Number 2. In that story, he's actually a friend of Aquaman and his father, and this man is obsessed with Atlantis, just like in this movie. Now, in the comics, Shin is a friend turned enemy, but they flipped that in the movie and showed Stephen become a reluctant foe turned friend. Anyway, Black Manta and his crew are looking for this rare substance called Orichalcum. Now, Orichalcum is a substance that can be found mentioned in many ancient texts, such as the stories of Atlantis by Plato. Within those writings, it was referred to as a substance second only to gold. Now, here in a sec, we'll talk about how Jason Momoa was not joking when he said that this Aquaman sequel was going to be about climate change, and orichalcum is totally meant to symbolize oil. And while it's a powerful and sought-after substance, it can also be very dangerous. Now, in the comics, we also saw Black Manta pursuing Orichalcum, and in the comics, Orichalcum was said to have been created by the Deserters, those desert creatures we actually get to see in this movie. So anyway, in those comics, Black Manta and a character that would later become known as Devil Ray come across this huge amount of Orichalcum. Long story short, the Orichalcum is being sought out by a bunch of people, and it's rumored to be able to rival even the trident of King Atlan, which, of course, in this movie, we saw Atlan's trident rip right through 
crew that Orichalcum Trident, but more on that in a bit. So in those comics, we see an Orichalcum Trident formed, which is what the Black Trident is in this movie. In the comics, Orichalcum can also be used to project your astral self to others, which we saw Kordax do to Black Manta via the Orichalcum Trident. And after being possessed by this Kordax character, which I'll tell you more about in just a sec, Black Manta took on a serious Green Goblin vibe, especially in the scene where we see Manta having a conversation with himself in the mirror, paralleling this scene from the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man. You killed them. We killed them. We? Remember? And speaking of Raimi Spider-Man, we got a great wink and nod to Raimi Spider-Man 2 when we see Arthur stop this train from crashing. He used his body, his trident, and even his foot to slow down and stop the train, just like we saw Spider-Man do in Spider-Man 2 when he uses his body, his foot, and his webs to stop that moving train. Okay, so let's break down this Kordax character. He was first introduced in Atlantic Comics number four in 1990. And unlike in the movie, he isn't the brother of King Atlan, but he still has a strong connection to Aquaman via the curse of Kordax. You see, Kordax in the comics has blonde hair, which was very rare for sea dwellers, and he also had the ability to communicate with sea life. Now, Aquaman as well in those comics has blonde hair and the ability, of course, to communicate with sea life, which led people to believe that Aquaman had the curse of Kordax. So I'm guessing the curse from the comics is what inspired the idea of linking this specific Aquaman character with the curse to black magic they tie to Orichalcum and the Black Trident. Also, while we're on the topic of Aquaman talking to fish, I love that in the opening narration of the movie, Aquaman acknowledges that some people make fun of him for being able to talk to fish, but he thinks it's really cool. Kind of a callback to this scene here in Peacemaker. Go f another fish, asshole. I'm so f***ing sick of that rumor. But it's also worth mentioning that unlike in the movie, in the comics, Kordax is not the leader of the Black City of Necris, aka the Lost Kingdom. That title actually belongs to another Aquaman villain called Mongo, a character who was introduced back in the 1960s in Aquaman number 30. Now, this character shared a lot of similarities to Orm, or Ocean Master, in their disdain for the surface dwellers. And while we're on the topic of classic Aquaman characters, I've got to talk about Aquaman's loyal sidekick, Topo, one of the best parts of this movie movie. Topo has been a part of Aquaman comics going all the way back to Adventure Comics number 229, which came out in 1956. So it was really cool getting to see Topo make his theatrical debut. When Topo and Aquaman go to break Orm out of prison, we get to see Aquaman's stealth suit. This suit first appeared in the 1986 Aquaman miniseries, a miniseries that featured Aquaman returning to Atlantis from his peaceful life with Mira on the surface, just like how in this movie we got to see Aquaman much preferring his life as a father on the surface surface to his life as a king under the sea. So when Arthur rescues Orm, we see that Orm has been severely malnourished and deprived of water, only ever being given just enough to stay alive. I don't need it. I don't need it. And I love that when we see Orm collapse to the ground and the ocean water pass over him and then boom, it's like instant muscles. Damn! It reminded me a lot of how in Batman v Superman and in The Flash, we saw Superman and Supergirl both go from a weakened state to people of steel when being graced by the sunlight. So earlier this year when I attended CinemaCon, I got a special first look at this Aquaman sequel, and my biggest takeaway was that it had serious Thor The Dark World vibes. Ruh -roh. Not in a bad way, but specifically its focus on two brothers who once fought over the throne, now breaking the other out of prison and working together to help save the day. You can only imagine how I felt when in this movie we hear Arthur literally call his brother Orm Loki. Beg your pardon. So when Arthur and Orm traveled to this pirate haven, I got real Star Wars Moss Eisley spaceport vibes. With all the different creatures and music playing, it was really cool. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. So, like I mentioned earlier, Jason Momoa wasn't kidding when he said that this movie was about climate change. There's tons of climate change imagery in this movie, such as the orichalcum representing oil and the dangers of drilling it, if not only in our oceans, but how it can heat the planet when doing so. And the volcano on Devil's Deep and the green orichalcum smoke coming from its top is totally imagery for the pollution that comes from burning fossil fuels and the damage that it can cause to the planet. Okay, so like off the top, this movie borrowed from 
from a lot of Aquaman comics, but one it was inspired by the most was Adventure Comics Volume 1, number 452. This comic featured Black Manta kidnapping Aquaman's son, and in that comic, we see Black Manta force Aquaman and his sidekick, Aqua Lad, to fight to the death to save Aqua Baby's life. In this movie, however, Orm took the place of Aqua Lad, and we saw Kordax possess Orm and try to force Aquaman to kill his own brother to save his baby and the planet. Now, in the comics, the baby dies, but the movie didn't go that far. And honestly, since this is probably the last time we'll be seeing this Aquaman, I'm glad they didn't kill the baby and allowed Arthur and his family to have a happy ending. Okay, so throughout the movie, I sensed a lot of parallels between Aquaman and T'Challa's Black Panther. T'Challa wanted Wakanda to reveal itself to the world and share its resources to help better the planet. Arthur wants to do the same thing with Atlantis, but even as king, he was held back by his council just like T'Challa. But come the end of the film, just like with T'Challa, we see Arthur reveal Atlantis to the world and join the UN, just like T'Challa did at the end of the first Black Panther movie. But this wasn't the only MCU reference the end of the movie had to offer. After Aquaman gave his awesome speech to the world revealing the existence of Atlantis, he grabs the mic and says, I am Aquaman. Of course, parodying this scene from the first Iron Man, podium and all. I am Iron Man. So there are all the Easter eggs I caught for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Did you guys catch anything I missed? And let me know what you thought of the movie, the final DCEU movie. Do you think we're ever going to see Jason Momoa play Aquaman again? Or are you like me thinking that we're going to get to see him go on to play Lobo? Let me know down in the comments below or you can at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, be sure to subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Colton Ogburn. <laughs>